Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. From God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to take some words from the Old Testament lesson this morning from Lamentations chapter 2. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about them, consider them. And the words were these, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Your great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of our Lord. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us your gospel in the Old Testament, giving us the good news that your mercies are new to us every day. Help us to be grateful for them, rejoice in them, and share them with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, next Wednesday is going to be July 4th, and we usually all have something that we plan to do on that day, and that's nice. Sometimes, though, when it comes in the middle of the week between weekends, we're not sure, do we want to take a couple days off before the 4th, or do we want to take it off a couple days after the 4th of July? Well, for those of you that might be taking off your time before the 4th of July, you might be tempted today to say, oh, how nice it is, I'm relaxing, I'm having a nice, this is a nice service and everything. And you might even be tempted to close your eyes and drift off. Well, I have a, a deal for you. I want you to stay awake, and so I've asked Isla just to kind of hang around the organ, that at some point, if it looks like we're all kind of falling asleep, she's going to start playing the national anthem, and that means we're all going to stand up, and then we'll get our blood flowing again, and we'll be fine. And it's okay. No, I'm not going to have her do that. But I thought that was kind of... I heard of a pastor that did that one time. We're happy that Pastor and Lisa have been blessed with a new baby girl, Rachel, and we wish them all of God's blessings and, uh, well, hopefully, like I said, some peaceful, restful uh, days uh, together uh, as a new family. Uh, I can remember when my boys were born, kind of what happened, and we had a little bit of rest, day or two, and people came in, and it was nice. And uh, at the same time, it's a blessing to be able to, to put that new family back together and see the newness of the newborn child at home. I received an interesting email from uh, a friend of mine. It was, it told of how our human body was such an amazing blessing and how it worked. Uh, for example, I didn't know this, but uh, we all, of course, have a heart, and that keeps us alive. But the average human heart pumps 2,000 gallons of blood each day, 24-hour period. You imagine that? 2,000 gallons? Holy cow. Uh, it beats nearly 100,000 times per day to get that blood moving. Our lungs take in about 17,000 breaths each 24-hour day, and we never think about it. We don't say, gee, I'll take a breath now. No, we don't do that. It just happens because that's the way our good Lord has made us in this body. Our brain processes between 40 and 50 thoughts per minute. That's almost a different one every second. Our eyes blink 28 to 29,000 times in a 24-hour period. Can you imagine that? Our body, this is amazing to me too, our body sheds a million skin cells a day and our brain and our mouth work together to speak some 2,000 to 5,000 words each day depending upon whether you're male or female, because we know that all men talk more than women do every day. Every night, now this is an interesting thought, every night we grow a third of an inch, about this much. Do you know that? Then we get up in the morning and walk around and we shrink about a third of an inch. If we didn't th shrink a third of an inch, it wouldn't be very long and all of us couldn't even get through the doors over there because we just keep growing. But that's what our body does. The, this is the one that is astounding to me. 
The average body eats and consumes, you ready for this? 50 tons of food during an average 80-year lifespan. 50 tons! It's amazing that we're as thin as we are. We just have to keep going. Isn't that something? And all this time, our body regenerates itself. In fact, our Lord has made our bodies so that there are certain cells that regenerate for a while. Well, for example, uh, uh, our, we get new taste buds about every 10 days. That's amazing to me. About every 6 to 10 months, our nails grow. Fingernails. Uh, about every 10 years, we get new bones. They just regenerate themselves. And we get a new heart about every 20 years. The only, by, by the way, the only cells that don't regenerate are our brain cells. That's what God gives us, and, and that's an amazing thing. They stay with us our whole time. So our bodies are becoming new every moment of the day. Trouble is, of course, is that those new cells don't come into us as making us a new person that we're younger. We get new old cells. If we're 70 or 75 years old, we get cells that replace, but those cells just still look like we're 75 years old. It's just the way it is. But God makes us new. He makes us, He creates us, and by His grace, we're becoming new all the time. And that's just an amazing thing. And yet, knowing this, and this is general knowledge by all kinds of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the uh, disciplines of, uh, in, in the world, yet still learned scientists say, you know what, that all happens by chance. That all came about because of, well, just time and, you know, space. Um, the science, though they don't refer to it this way, uh, relies almost entirely upon three things. Father Time, Mother Earth, and Lady Luck. That's what they say. But yet, you and I know that this scientific trinity, if you want to think of it that way, that's not what has made us what we are. And that's not what creates us new every day either. We know better. God who made us is the trinity we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then later on in Genesis, which by the way it sounds like there was just, you know, one person there who created us, but later on in Genesis God says, let us make man. Let us make people. Father, Son, Holy Spirit involve themselves in the creation of the people that we are. Our bodies with their complex systems that are far too intricate far too complicated to have come about by just simply time, chance, and luck. Now in these warm days of summer, it is refreshing to hear the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah speak about God's mercy and love. Jeremiah, you know, he wrote, and this comes from the book of Lamentations, which means he was lamenting all of the problems that he saw in his world. The people had left God. The people had ignored God. They'd even rejected God. And yet, Jeremiah could see the goodness of God so well that he could say such wonderful things as God's mercies never end. They're new to us every morning because the steadfast love of God never ceases. So his feelings of sadness over what he saw in his society were made an abrupt change. And that new change was quite simply that God gives us newness every day. Therefore, Jeremiah says, I'm going to hope in him. I'm not going to hope in medicine or science or whatever it happens to be. I'm going to hope in him. 
for the Lord is good for those who wait for him to the soul who seeks him. It is good that we should wait quietly for the salvation of our God. You and I need to hear some good news. We really do. It's easy to find fault with everything we see around us today. Government doesn't seem to know what it's doing. People don't seem to care that we've lost common sense in so many areas. In our, even in our conversations become really so crude, nasty. Wrong behaviors seem to be winning over what is right. Things, as one lady says, faster they're just going to pot in our world. Like one fellow says, the Rockies bullpen can't even win a game these days. All this makes us long for some good news. We all need to hear God's good news, and Jeremiah, of all people, has it for us today. The good news is that God's mercy and faithfulness are still with us, just like they were 2,500 years ago when Jeremiah wrote these words. His compassion does not fail, new every morning. And since this is as true today as it was in Jeremiah's day, we do well to hear those words. Therefore, he says, I'm going to hope in him, in the Lord. I'm not going to hope in human knowledge. I'm not going to hope in this world that seems to be going to pot. I'm going to hope in him. For the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Despite what sins may try, uh, may happen to try to destroy our world, our Heavenly Father is still the one where we will find our hope. We're not going to find our hope in Wall Street, or in the Oval Office, or in the lofty halls of secular universities. Because I'll tell you one thing for sure, or actually several things, bank accounts will fail. Governments will disappoint us. Secular universities can be misled all over the place. Baseball is just a game. Real hope does not come in any of these things. It comes in our Lord Jesus Christ, the lasting figure of history whom God brought into our history to show us his love and mercy and forgiveness. It's knowing and believing that Jesus is our Lord, that he'll bring us through this mixed up world to a better place in eternity. Maybe some of you saw the table out there. I, when I retired, I decided to become a writer and I've got a number of things. Well, just recently I finished my last, my fourth and last uh, final uh, daily devotional. And when I mentioned this to a few people, including my family, my son, Chuck, who's a Christian day school teacher in Phoenix, and by the way, they're going to be here with us next weekend. But he sensed, I guess, that I needed something to do. And so he sent me a long, detailed a message that said, could you give me a hand with... Uh, what I can and how I can teach my eighth graders about the Holy Trinity. He says, they know all about, you know, con creation and evolution. They know a lot about the Bible. They know Bible stories. They know their salvation in Jesus. But he says, a number of them, when it comes to the, uh, the, uh, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they're just stumped. And he says, quite frankly, I am kind of too. He says, how, can you give me some information on this? He says, even though I believe it, I can't quite understand it. And of course, I wrote him back and I said, neither can I. I said, the Trinity is not something that's easy to, to understand. By the way, I really enjoy it when my boys ask me for advice. That's a great thing. By the way, Pastor, as your boys get older and they ask you for advice, just like all the rest of us, you're going to say, oh man, I can't. I've been waiting for this, you know, so you can give them a little bit of your advice. My son, Brian, my second son, he usually asks for help with mechanical stuff. And my son, Chuck, the teacher, asks me about teaching stuff. And if I'm really fortunate, I can still get that little, uh, a little lawnmower engine running for Brian. With Chuck, I usually try to find some materials that perhaps he can adapt. And then, of course, he'll put them into a PowerPoint presentation, and they become really a good teaching tool. But I've also discovered something amazing, that you can't fix everything. 
Uh, it's actually easier today to buy a new Briggs and Stratton engine than it is to fix the old one. Isn't that right, Terry? I mean, you know, they're hard to do. And put out a couple hundred bucks, you can get a new one, and, and it'll work a whole lot better. And yet, we know that there's not a whole lot more than we can find to understand this thing called the Holy Trinity. What does that mean? How do we tell a teenager or his parents how and why God comes to us as three in one? Three persons, yet only one God. There are some examples in nature that we've used for a long time. I, in my confirmation instruction, talked about the apple that has three parts. It's got the skin, it's got the apple meat in the middle, and then the core. Or an egg that's got three parts, the shell, the white, and the yolk. Or the best one with me is, quite frankly, a triangle, because you cannot have a triangle unless you have three sides. There's other things, too. Um, my wife taught me the other day, she opened up a banana and she said, look here, Bob, because she knew I was working on the idea. She said, look here, and she was able with her fingers to manipulate that banana into three parts. It fits together into one, but it's actually three parts that make up the one. Even in marriage, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, Solomon says, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, I believe that passage means that when a man and woman come together in marriage and they include God in their marriage as that third string, that cord is not easily broken. It can be broken, yes, but it means that it's stronger because of what Christ has done for us. Again, three strands becomes one marriage. And that's good news. All of this is good news. Our world that we wonder about, that we wonder where it's going and where it's headed, in that world, we can depend upon our God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to help us get through it, to help us live this world in this body that he's given us. It's God the Father who creates us. It's God the Son who forgives us all of our sins. It's God the Holy Spirit who helps us to trust in Jesus and guides us in holy living as God wants us to live. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. So Jeremiah says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him. The soul who seeks him. It's good that we should wait quietly for the salvation of our God. It's almost as if we live in a never-ending story of God's love for us. A never-ending love story that God began when he created the world. We live, you know, in a world that's so greatly blessed. We have so many freedoms. So much prosperity. It's just staggering. Uh, I look back on my, my parents, immigrants, who came here, and they came and basically just started at the bottom, digging in the soil and, and farming. And they too saw amazing prosperity, but even though they've been passed away since the last century in the 90s, they couldn't imagine amazing inventions that we have that God has allowed us to have in our world. Our leisure time, incredible, the things that we can do. We have so many blessings in this nation, so much to be grateful for. One might even ask themselves the question, well, with all this blessing, is it possible that God might withdraw? His blessings from this nation, such as what happened in Jeremiah's time. Jeremiah said to the people, God's mercies are new every day. They didn't listen to him. They turned their back on the Lord. They decided to ignore him, and many to deny him completely. We pray that would never happen to this nation. 
Jeremiah saw it happen. He saw their people forsake their privileged status with God and follow their own humanistic ways. His life, by the way, as a prophet was very difficult. Um, at various times, the Bible says that Jeremiah was locked in a cistern for weeks. And there's nothing nice about being down in a dank, uh, cold, damp uh, hole in the ground. Uh, there are other times when he was beaten, he was placed in stocks, whipped, imprisoned, and that all happened by his fellow Judeans, his fellow Hebrews. Ironically, the guy who was nicest to Jeremiah was the King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The one, you remember about them, three men in the fiery furnace and Daniel in the lion's den? He was the one who treated Jeremiah well. But of course, it was not to be lasting. Tradition tells us that Jeremiah was killed by his fellow Judeans. It took courage to be a prophet in the days of Jeremiah. Modern disciples or prophets today may feel like they, they are worked and they know a lot and they, they may feel that they're, they're privileged, but we can still learn something from Jeremiah. He was truly saddened by what the people had become, and yet he did not despair. He did not throw up his hands and walk away. While there was much that saddened him because of the sin and evil that he saw in their society, he never lost faith that God's mercy and love would always be there. He never lost faith that God would turn his back on those who trust him. The good news, therefore, that we all need to hear today and every day is that God's mercies are new to us every day. He stays with us no matter whether we stay with him or not. And by the way, I'm glad that you stayed with me and that you didn't fall asleep so that I had to go over and start playing the national anthem. And in the coming days, we'll maybe have a chance to, to hear it sung or maybe even sing along if you go to a baseball game or some other game. We will be blessed as we do remembering the blessings of God upon our nation that started back in the 1770s and continue with us yet today. And in the midst of it, let's always remember God's never-ending love story for us, that by Jeremiah the prophet, we know the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, stand guard over our hearts and our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.